Resuming debate, the Honourable Member for South Okanagan, West Kootenai. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'm happy to uh, have the opportunity uh, here this afternoon to speak to this important subject, Bill C-30, regarding the comprehensive economic and trade agreement between Canada and the European Union. Canada is a trading nation. And as we've heard so many times in this debate, we need good trade agreements. And we need to diversify our trading markets. Trade is too important to get these agreements wrong, especially with such an important partner as the European Union. We have to take the time to get it right. But this government seems to be in a real rush to get this treaty ratified. The government signed CETA on October 30th. And, you know, the government has a set policy for the tabling of treaties in Parliament. That policy states that treaties must be tabled with explanatory notes 21 days before the enabling legislation is presented. But what happened with CETA? The enabling legislation, this bill, Bill C-30, was put on the order paper two days before the agreement was even signed. And it was tabled in Parliament on October 31st, the day after the signing. What's the hurry? European Union nations are going to be taking their time, making sure that this deal is good for them. Why are we giving them that advantage? And we should be taking our time as well, making sure we get it right. There are obviously good things about freer trade with Europe. We're happy to see the reduction or elimination of tariffs for Canadian industries, particularly those in the agricultural sector, such as beef, pork, and canola. We like free trade when it's fair trade. Mr. Speaker, there's a forest products mill in my riding, Greenwood Forest Products, that creates laminated pine shelving and furniture parts. They sell their own products across Western North America, but to serve Eastern Canada and the Eastern United States, they import finished products from Romania. It's cheaper to do that than ship products across Canada. That's another story. So they depend on trade with the European Union to survive. They don't pay any tariffs on products coming from the EU now, so CETA won't directly benefit them, but they do appreciate any strengthening of trade ties between Canada and Europe. And they may likely have to do more business in Europe in the near future because they are deeply concerned about the direction the softwood lumber agreement is taking with the United States. Their products have never been hit by countervail duties or tariffs in the past with the U.S., but the recent moves in the United States between the U.S. lumber industry and the U.S. Department of Commerce have apparently expanded the number of products and types of products covered under the industry complaints to include a wide variety of value-added products instead of being restricted to the dimension lumber that, as it has been in the past. So they're very disappointed with this government's inaction on the softwood lumber front. And they are a good example of why we need to diversify our trading relationships. We need good trade deals with other nations and other regions. But we don't want bad deals, deals that will result in decreased market share for Canadian companies, unfair competition, reduced sovereignty, and significant job losses. We're particularly worried about the investor state dispute provisions brought in by this agreement. Under similar trade agreements, Canada has become one of the most sued countries in the world winning only three of 39 cases against foreign interests as we try to maintain our sovereignty in legislating protections for the environment, health, and other social interests. And I'd just like to quote something from the Canadian Environmental Law Association about this. They say CETA will significantly impact environmental protection and sustainable development in Canada. In particular, the inclusion of an investor state dispute settlement mechanism the liberalization of trade in services and the deregulation of government procurement, procurement rules will impact the federal and provincial government's authority to protect the environment, promote resource conservation, or use green procurement as a means of advancing environmental policies and objectives. Yes, there are carve outs for some of these categories, but that will not stop corporations from initiating litigation, forcing us to prove that we are protected and putting a regulatory chill on governments across this country, stopping them from enacting pro progressive legislation as they fear possible litigation. Since some European regions are clear that they want this provision removed, 
why does Canada feel compelled to insist on this part of the agreement when it is clearly not in our national interest? I'm also concerned about what CETA will do for drug costs in Canada. Changes to intellectual property rules for pharmaceuticals under CETA are expected to increase drug costs by more than $850 million annually. This is not only harmful to individual Canadians and their families who are struggling to get by, it will make it increasingly difficult to bring in a national pharmacare program in Canada, something that this country desperately needs. We in the NDP are also concerned about compensation for sectors that are negatively impacted by CETA. The dairy industry was promised compensation by the previous Conservative government, but this Liberal government is now offering dairy farmers less than 10% of the amount previously on the table. And there are other sectors that are directly or indirectly affected by this agreement. And Mr. Speaker, as you and many other members know, my riding of South Okanagan and West Kootenay produces the finest wines in Canada. I'll admit that good wines are produced across the country, from Vancouver Island to Nova Scotia. I've sampled a nice wine produced from grapes grown by, grown by the President of the Treasury Board, and I hear that the member from Brome, Missisquoi, makes a great late harvest Vidal. The Canadian wine industry is a very important sector in the Canadian economy, contributing $8 billion to the national bottom line. It almost died after the free trade agreement with the U.S. in 1988, but through hard work on the part of a few small wineries, a long-term vision, and an attention to high-quality products, the industry survived to live another day and now produces some of the best wines in the world. Now, in 2004, Canada signed a wine and spirits agreement with the European Union. Since that time, imports from the European Union to Canada have increased by 40 million litres to 180 million litres a year, valued at $1.16 billion. This compares to Canadian exports to the EU of only 123,000 litres, valued at $2.7 million, a significant imbalance. Canada has one of the fastest growing wine markets in the world. More and more Canadians are drinking wine, but three quarters of that growth has gone to imported wines. The Canadian wine industry is not asking for protection or tariffs under CETA. They are in favour of continued free trade with, in wine with Europe, but they are asking for help from the federal government to build the domestic industry to a level at which it can fairly compete with Europe and other wine regions of the world. The Canadian wine industry, through the Canadian Vintners Association, is asking the federal government to implement a 10-year wine industry innovation program to support the growth of this industry and create jobs across Canada. We need to be supporting Canadian industries at this time so they are not unduly harmed by these trade agreements, but instead can truly take advantage of them. So to conclude, Mr. Speaker, the NDP is very much in favour of trade. We are very much in favour of good trade agreements. We simply want to ensure that these agreements are in the best interests of Canada, that they help grow local industries, and that they support job creation across the country. Thank you. Questions and